In these videos, we're going to talk about digital forensics. Hopefully by the end of this, we will have covered three things. The first is the stages of digital forensics. The second is the legal basis for it. And the third, its role in criminal cases. So let's start with Locard's exchange principle, which is that physical contact between objects inevitably results in the exchange of matter leaving traces that can be analysed to partially reconstruct the event. And that's actually the basis of all forensics. But digital contact leaves other traces. Browser history, for example. Logs. When you logged in, when you logged out. Other events. File creation, modification dates, ownership, all the metadata that's associated with files. Document metadata, such as author, version history. Backup files and then things like communications, email, messages. In digital forensics, it's the discipline of collecting digital evidence that's related to an incident in such a way as to be able to be used in criminal and civil proceedings. So criminal investigations, uh, intelligence gathering, e-discovery in relation to civil law, and incident response. So digital forensics plays a part in all of these things, and we'll cover some of that in these videos. Digital data may be present on a range of devices, such as hard drives, uh, in-computer memory, peripheral device memory, such as printers, removable drives like USB drives, smartphones, in IoT, and cars through navigation and entertainment systems. The IoT is particularly interesting from uh, the point of view of wearables like Fitbits, for example, or smartwatches, which uh, record a great deal of information and have been involved in some well-known criminal cases. Collecting this data involves doing so in a way that maintains the integrity of the data and its associated metadata, such as creation and modification times and dates. Digital forensic specialists use special de specific devices that can image a disk or extract memory without the possibility of writing to the disk at the same time. This prevents any metadata from being changed and is part a very important part of the chain of custody. In the US, three cases in the 1990s established the Dobert standard for scientific evidence in legal proceedings. And this is the underpinnings of the legal basis for gathering evidence in this way. So the theoretical underpinnings of the methods must yield testable predictions by means of which the theory could be falsified, i.e. the process should be a scientific one. The method should preferably be published in peer-reviewed journals. There should be a known rate of error that can be used in evaluating the results and the methods should be generally accepted within the relevant scientific community. So forensics was based on the, the principle that all of the approaches to it should be scientifically valid and that we should know the accuracy of these approaches so that the courts could make their decisions based on evidence and not on just opinion. There's a well-known case in Perth, for example, where an engineer offered his opinion about uh, whether somebody could have fallen off a bridge or whether they were pushed. And of course, there wasn't any evidence that was presented to back up the model, and it was eventually rejected by the court um, as expert opinion. In the UK, the Law Commission built on this. So they took the Dobert standard and actually added that no action taken by law enforcement should change data that may be subsequently relied on in court. People collecting data should be competent to do so. So that's an important um, facet which is not present in uh, either the US or in Australia, uh, which is that the people collecting the forensics uh, experts should be actually certified. An audit trail that enables someone else to reproduce the results should be kept and there should be someone in charge to ensure that the law and these principles are kept. The UK now requires accreditation, which is the ISO 17020 and 025 standards. So some legal issues with digital evidence. 
um, that have been raised. So proving attribution is sometimes hard. Someone else used my Wi-Fi, and this was the claim made by a lot of people brought to court uh, when accused of torrenting illegally uh, movies. So uh, it was actually sometimes hard to prove that somebody wasn't just hijacking the Wi-Fi. Of course, uh, the courts need to decide whether then uh, they have left their Wi-Fi open or uh, were still had, um, held to account because their Wi-Fi had been used for illegal purposes. Uh, we have to ensure that evidence is not tampered with or altered, and that's problematic sometimes. Having the correct search warrants and authority to actually search for the digital evidence in the first place. And so uh, there have been cases where searching for one thing and then discovering evidence for a different crime, for example, looking at a computer to look at evidence of search history for looking up bond manufacturer and discovering that there's uh, pornography, illegal pornography on the computer at the same time. Without the correct search warrants um, to go looking for that, then that evidence may not be admissible in a court. The destruction of evidence by parties is also an issue. So uh, either defendants or uh, prosecutors uh, deliberately... Uh, de uh, the destruction of evidence by parties is also an issue. So either the defendants or prosecutors deliberately wiping disks, for example or tampering with a file to make it look like it was altered or modified in a particular way uh, when in fact it wasn't. These things are actually quite hard to prove sometimes. So there's a couple of approaches to forensic um, examination. There's the principle of state-centric and history-centric. State-centric is a snapshot of the current system e.g., uh, or for example, a hard drive or even memory. You can infer prior states from that snapshot. So the idea here is that you take a snapshot of memory as it is, and then you can say, well, we can see a process here. We, can, we know that it's been running for this length of time, and so it must have been started you know, at or approximately around this particular time, for example. History-centric is another approach which looks at things like logs, and looks for time-stamped events that may establish a full record of events. So logs like computer operating system logs, application logs, network traffic, for example. So key things here about um, how you actually rebuild what was happening at the time of the use of the equipment, the infrastructure, uh, the computers. So the forensic process is outlined in the NIST SP-886 Guide to Integrating Forensic Techniques into Incidents Response. They uh, specify four stages, which start with collection, looking through at examination, analysis, and then reporting. So looking for media, uh, data on that media, extracting information from that and analyzing it and then turning that into evidence that can be used. So it's not simply enough just to find uh, data um, on a disk. You have to know the scope, what it is you're actually looking for and how this would actually establish evidence that would support a claim made by prosecutors or the defense for what they are claiming. And so that's the whole forensic process. Collection of data. Establishing data provenance is critical and maintaining integrity of that data. So we need to identify the possible sources of data that we're interested in. Other than devices, there may be third party records of activity such as ISP, data, metadata retention, mobile phone company records, social media company information, and all of those may take, part, may take place in uh, adding to evidence around a case. Securing the device before someone else is able to delete files or tamper with evidence is critical, although it is often possible to recover files that users have thought that they deleted. Um, of course, we get into the whole issue of the fact that data may be encrypted and 
Uh, there are a variety of different ways of actually getting around this, and this has led to uh, political discussions around whether law enforcement should be able to install back doors. In Australia, there is legislation that allows the government to go to any vendor and ask them to put back doors into um, software applications to enable them to intercept communications that would normally be encrypted. Of course, they don't call them backdoors. Uh, they just and they assure, they uh, claim that this won't lead to systematic uh, weaknesses in the product. But we'll deal with that when we look at uh, the legal basis for cybersecurity in a later video. Data can be collected from live machines and also from disks and memory devices that are we're termed dead. Data is copied from storage and other devices in a bitwise manner, i.e. getting an image of raw data. Usually this is done in 512 byte chunks that equate to a sector on the disk. This avoids changing the file system in any way during the reads and we can use a write block device to actually copy the data. We don't use lo logical data acquisition process because essentially the file system uh, or in the operating system that is running it could alter the data in some specific way. And that would be proprietary based on what operating system we're dealing with and the file system itself. So it's important to actually understand that when we copy, we copy it physically uh, and then reconstruct that data and then it doesn't really matter so much what the file system is because we then extract data in a variety of different ways. So the main decisions that are involved in data acquisition are the likely value of the data to achieve the objectives that you've set out to um, achieve, the volatility of uh, that data, uh, being aware that the data might disappear if machines are powered down, for example, files may be updated at that point, and that's what you don't really want to happen. We need to focus on the amount of effort required and therefore money um, that you want to invest in the process. And the fact that once data is acquired, it needs to be actually verified. So these aren't just technical decisions that go into uh, what it is we actually collect and how we collect the data. It is potentially possible to buy third-party software to break into a mobile phone, but if the crime is trivial, we may not want to invest um, that expense of actually using that type of technology uh, to actually break into the phone.